Good morning, everyone. It is so exciting to see um, your wonderful faces so bright and early. I always like to reward those who um, arrive on time by starting on time. Um, I'm Dr. Melissa Gilliam. I am chief of the section of family planning and contraceptive research here at the University of Chicago. Um, this is one of my great pleasures. Um, I woke up this morning and told my husband, this is one of the best days of the year, the year that we have our conference, um, the day that we have our conference. And um, it's an exciting time for us because it allows us to spend a day thinking deeply about um, issues that are really important. And we um, like to spend this day focusing on the ways in which policy, clinical care, and it's the work that we're doing every day with patients and communities, how those, those come together in important ways. And um, I think the pressing issue for many of us right now is healthcare reform. As a physician who provides reproductive health, um, I feel like um, I'm often so caught up in my day-to-day -day patient care that I sometimes forget the larger policies that influence the care that we provide. So this is a really important day for me as well because I get to um, really think about the politics and policies that we deal with. It's also an exciting day because we are able to um, invite some of the leading thinkers and researchers in the country. And um, lucky for us, many of those um, people are right here on campus. And, um, but also, we are able to do what we call a call for papers. And so we ask people to present their research. And we're able to um, really select from leading, leading entries from uh, various researchers across the country. And so we'll um, introduce these individuals to you throughout the day. Um, there's a little bit of housekeeping that I always ask um, you all to, uh, one, fill out your evaluations. Two, when we have questions, there's a microphone in the middle, um, and so we'd ask you to come and uh, please um, query and discuss with our, um, with our speakers today. There's also literature on the back tables, and um, there's a reception at the end of the day, and I will remind you of all of those things throughout the day. Okay, so my, um, I first actually get to um, have the pleasure of introducing Ramon Gutierrez, who um, is the director of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, who, um, and this is the organization that has co-sponsored this and many of our conferences. So we are um, incredibly grateful to Ramon and the um, Race Center for letting us be here today. Um, Dr. Gutierrez is, uh, is the Preston and Sterling Morton Distinguished Professor in History and the College. He is one of the nation's leading Latino scholars. He's received numerous academic awards, including the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant, the John Hope Franklin Prize from the American Studies Association, and the Frederick Jackson Turner Prize from the Organization of American Historians. He specializes in Mexican-American history, Indian white relations in the Americas, social and economic history of the Southwest, colonial Latin America, and Mexican immigration. In addition to two monographs and numerous articles, he has edited, co-edited, or co-authored 10 books. So um, I, it gives me a lot of pleasure to let uh, Ramon Gutierrez take the stage and um, welcome you as well. Thank you, Melissa. Melissa is the one who puts in all the hard work during the year to make these conferences occur. And this is the sixth annual conference on honoring uh, women's reproductive health and freedom. Hardly any morning when I turn on NPR uh, on a daily basis, it's hard not to notice that there's a, a counter-revolution going on in this country, particularly uh, against women and their reproductive uh, care. Uh, I mean, just yesterday I was turning on the NPR and it was about the Republican Congress trying to eliminate Planned Parenthood. Well, Melissa has been one of the soldiers who has been trying to get reproductive care and reproductive justice on the, on the national agenda. And over the past years, she's sponsored a number of conferences among them, for example, Respons Responsible Fathering, which was last year. Two years ago, we had a conference on virtual sex education to allow young people uh, who didn't have access to uh, sex education in the schools to be able to learn about their reproductive health issues uh, online. So this year, uh, the conference is focused on reproductive justice and uh, health care reform. And 
I'm sure you'll uh, be very stimulated by the speakers that we have today. And I want to thank Melissa in advance and her team for organizing this incredible conference. Thank you for being here today. One other housekeeping note. Um, could people from the section of family planning raise their hands? Okay. So um, these are the people who will be around today to help you if you need anything. And then uh, Lee Hasselbacker and Sarah Orzali are in the back. And um, any credit for organizing this conference goes to the two of them. They've just done uh, fabulous and tireless work. Um, so I get the uh, pleasure next of um, introducing our first keynote speaker, um, Harold Pollack. Harold Pollack is the Helen Ross Professor at the School of Social Service Administration and Faculty Chair of the Center for Health Administration Studies. He is also co-director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab. He has published widely at the interface between poverty, policy, and public health. His recent research concerns HIV and hepatitis prevention efforts for injection drug users, drug abuse and dependence among welfare recipients and pregnant women, infant mortality prevention, and child health. His research appears in such journals as Addiction, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the American Journal of Public Health, Health Services Research, Pediatrics, and Social Service Review. Professor Pollack has been appointed to three expert committees of the National Academy of Science. He received his undergraduate degree magna cum laude in electrical engineering and computer science from Princeton University. He holds master's and doctorate degrees in public policy from the Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University. Before coming to SSA, he was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Scholar in Health Policy Research at Yale University and taught health management and policy at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Pollack. Thanks so much for that gracious introduction, and the fact that you came off of the disabled list to get up and do that was, uh, was even more impressive. I'm, I wish my mom could have heard that introduction. That would have been, uh, although I think after hearing Dr. Gutierrez's that that would have, uh, she would have said, ah, so you're the Helen Ross <laughs> uh, uh, Thanks so much for inviting me also. I should say that uh, International House has a special um, place in my heart. Is anyone here a doctoral student? Uh, so the, when the, 20 years ago, I was a struggling doctoral student, uh, and, I was, uh, and I came to the University of Chicago to a conference over at Ida Noyes that William Julius Wilson had organized, and I had basically no money, uh, and I actually brought food with me, which I hung out the window in my room during the winter to, uh, in, until uh, conference staff took some pity on me and allowed me to steal some of the fancy lunches. But uh, I remember my bed folded into a desk upstairs, uh, and, and you know, and now, um, and now here I am giving a, giving a keynote address downstairs. So there's there's hope for all of you. Uh, um, so I'm going to give the 10,000th talk on health reform today. I, I I think that's official. And maybe Adam, depending on how you count, maybe Adam's going to do it. There um, uh, about what's. Uh, right and wrong about, uh, about health reform. I'm actually going to focus on the public health dimension, which gets less attention, actually, than many other aspects of health reform, but it's, it's a topic that's, that's dear to many of us in this room. I'm, I'm, I apologize that I do not have PowerPoint today. I figured that, that uh, I, had, I was afraid I would lure you all into a sort of narcoleptic stupor by going through the my long list of PowerPoints, uh, but I promise you that I actually did prepare in case there's any questions that come up later. There, um, uh, there, uh, uh, and in particular, I want to talk about the political predicament that we're in in, in public health services uh, that, is, that is, in some cases, exemplified by what, what's happening in the fight over health reform. And, and I'll have some specific things to say about reproductive health services, but also I'll be talking about some general issues that we're facing. Uh, uh, I'll talk about some policy substance, but uh, I'll throw in some politics too, because that's really the, the moment that we're in. Uh, there, uh, we're privileged to live through some real history right now. Uh, and you know, we, we, we're not always enjoying it, uh, but we can always learn from it. And I think that that's, uh, uh, that's important. And I'll just say in brief, I'm very enthusiastic about the Affordable Care Act 
uh, on the substance of public health policy. I think people actually uh, should be more uh, appreciative of what's actually in the bill that was passed than many of us are. It's very easy to be disappointed about what was not in the bill. Uh, but a lot of the things that were in the bill uh, were, uh, were pretty impressive. I, I'm, uh, I'm much more fearful about the politics, which of course means that I'm therefore much more fearful about the policy because, uh, be, because policy substance requires good politics to be funded and sustained. So let me start with some matters of substance. So I feel like Fidel Castro up at the lectern with, as I turn the pages, because I, I need more pages if I were Fidel. I think he, he'd like to go on for four or five hours, and I think I'll stop at two or three. But uh, uh, you know, from, uh, from many perspectives, health reform was a victory, but a frustrating and incomplete one. Uh, and uh, many people have reasons to be ambivalent about what was passed. But I think in public health, we have less reason to be ambivalent. Uh, the politics and the history books of health reform won't be decided by its public health provisions and fine print, but, but they're there. Uh, and it, it has really altered and improved our nation's public health infrastructure and uh, in, in many ways that, that, are, that, uh, th that have made themselves felt and that will make themselves felt as, as it's fully implemented. Uh, you know, for example, uh, the Affordable Care Act is, more, is, is, the, is a more important piece of AIDS policy than any national AIDS strategy ever released. It's a more important illicit drug policy than any illicit drug policy document ever released, probably. Uh, although that's saying not a whole lot, given uh, American drug policy. Uh, and it's probably the most important reproductive health document uh, that's that's been passed in a long time, and uh, you know, and, and Adam will, will say more about that. Uh, uh, and I think the, it's easy to overlook the accomplishments that this bill has, and so I'm going to mention four of them that have special impact for public health. First is near universal coverage will reduce race ethnic disparities, particularly in some key cardiovascular risk factors and hypertension. Uh, and uh, you know, from a public health perspective, I just I realize that uh, in the world of reproductive health, hypertension is is there, but it's not the most critical issue. But it is by far the most important at the population level way that ACA is going to actually reduce disparities. So I think it's it's now I don't want to overstate things. Uh, uh, health reform is not going to address many of the social determinants of health that are driving health disparities. And so we have to be sophisticated enough to know that, um, that there are many, many causes of health disparities that we have to, uh, that we have to address in, in arenas very far from health reform. Certainly kids who are getting shot in Chicago this year, you know, what they need is uh, something different from a focus on personal health services. Uh, but you can also become very jaded and to underestimate the impact of just the value of making sure that everyone can get to a doctor. Uh, one of the, as a non-physician, one of the things that's striking to me is, is if you look at the data, suppose that you hurt your knee and you go to the doctor. Most of the time the doctor's not going to do anything for your knee, really give you some Tylenol, uh, you know, put on a, do a laying on of hands, maybe send you for an MRI, but they will take your blood pressure. And if you have a problem with your blood pressure, they'll put you on an effective medication. And uh, if you look at the data that goes back to the old RAND health insurance experiment, uh, what they found was that people who had free care, who were low income, particularly low income people with health problems, uh, had, had significantly lower predicted mortality than, than people, than, the, than otherwise comparable people who were put into a, what's the, what we would now call a catastrophic health plan. And the reason is just people went to the doctor. And so things like getting a vision check, getting your blood pressure checked, the, those things are really important. By the way, a lot of people get those services in reproductive health settings right now. And so providing access to those settings for people is a really important way to make sure that people get some very basic ability to address their general health. Uh, uh, it's striking how many people go to Planned Parenthood for things that have nothing to do with uh, uh, you know, whether or not they're pregnant. For example, if they're men. Uh, they're, um, so. Uh, uh, and I think preventive care, as we learn more about preventive care, the ability to just do basic primary care and ensure access to that becomes more important. Uh, 
There's actually some very interesting stories, uh, data looking at Medicare, looking at some of the disparities before and after age 65. And it's really striking how racial disparities, for example, in systolic blood pressure, declined by about 60% age, after age 65. And uh, uh, race ethnic disparities in blood glucose control declined by a lot. Many disparities between Hispanics and whites in basic cardiovascular risk factors really decline or go away after age 65. And Medicare is not a terrific preventive health program, but it does a lot for people. So, so uh, you know, we don't know how these benefits will exactly carry over to younger people. Uh, many details matter, but it's important. And I mention that here because I think we have to, uh, we have to understand that this is, this is actually quite valuable. Uh, and uh, secondly, health reform extends Medicaid eligibility to every American with an income below 133% of the poverty line. Uh, this really transforms the safety net of care. Uh, you know, right now, Medicaid is a means-tested categorical program which, which only covers some low-income individuals, uh, low-income children, uh, TANF recipients, SSI recipients, and, and, and others. Many of the poor people we care the most about, they're just not eligible for Medicaid. Uh, you know, I do a lot of uh, drug policy research, substance abuse research, and if you, if you leave today and you walk down 57th Street, you might be asked for some money or for, for some food by, by a, someone standing in front of Medici's who has a drug problem. And you know, he's not, he's not a mom, he's not a vet, he has, he has a substance use issue, but that's not a qualifying condition for federal disability programs. So if somebody says, gee, well, I'd like to get that guy some help, I'd like to get him into some drug treatment, uh, who's gonna pay for that? Uh, well, after 2014, that person's gonna be a Medicaid recipient if he's poor. And that will make a huge difference, not just, by the way, for his drug problem, because the truth is, once you get him in there and you look at his drug problem, you're gonna discover, well, first of all, he may have a psychiatric comorbidity. He's got some arthritis that has never been dealt with. He's got some cardiovascular issues. Those are not things that the substance abuse treatment provider is gonna be able to deal with, even if you could pay for that. So uh, the ability to cover people through Medicaid really, really strengthens the safety net for those individuals. And of course, it also strengthens the safety net for the people providing the care right now who are not gonna get paid what they need to get paid to keep the lights on. So, so the Medicaid expansion to 16 million people is just a critical, critical uh, uh, advance. And uh, so, that's, uh, so that's a second, uh, so second point. There, uh, I should say, by the way, in the world of uh, reproductive health services, so right now if you have a young woman who's uninsured who goes to a reproductive health clinic for a pap smear or for some other services, well, suppose she's diagnosed with a significant health problem while she's there. Health reform really solidifies our ability to get people into care and to do what needs to be done to take care of them. Uh, another point, this is now we get into the fine print of the health reform. Just in case you were awake, I want to make sure that you're going to sort of gently lull down. Do we, if you need to stand up and do some Tai Chi while I'm talking, that's okay. Uh, the security staff's been notified that, uh, that that's okay. They're, um, so uh, the new law requires insurers to cover without cost sharing many evidence-based preventive services. And in particular, insurers have to cover services that receive an A or B rating from the United States Preventive Services Task Force or that are supported by comparable other bodies like that. How many people have heard of the Amer United States Preventive Services Task Force? How many of you are raising your hand just because you're embarrassed because your friend raises their hand? <laughs> so there, what's interesting about this, that's a group of academics and health services researchers who review randomized trials and the evidence base for particular clinical preventive services. And what's interesting about these services is that many of them focus on politically marginalized or obscure populations. Uh, some of these services have been the subject of prolonged political or regulatory battles to get routine reimbursement. In the substance abuse field, we spend a lot of time trying to get basic screening for substance abuse covered. Uh, and uh, you know, a friend of mine commented that no one's ever won an election by wearing a t-shirt that says chlamydia screening on the front, or you know, gonorrhea screening. 
You know, those are, you're, you, those are really not the, you know, Will I Am's not making videos about that. And, but they're really important. And, uh, and it turns out that a lot of the services that the safety net provides have a very strong evidence base that says these are actually quite effective. And although cost effectiveness is not a part of the calculus, they're also quite cost effective and that tends to show up implicitly in, in many of these things too. So before health reform, you really needed to negotiate these issues on a case-by-case -case basis with, to show a particular insurer that there was a financial case for that insurer to cover that service. And if you look at the public health implications of that, uh, it's a much better situation after health reform and there's been a real shift in perspective that says this is social responsibility to cover evidence-based services that benefit the community. And one of the issues with sexually transmitted infections is the insurer is not focused on the externalities that the person who is infected is going to create throughout the community. You know, from a public health perspective, we need to cover things that, that will benefit the community, not necessarily will provide an immediate return for the person paying for care for that patient. There, um, uh, so that's a, that's a critical change and it, it immediately makes many of the clinical trials that people do policy relevant because if you can show that something is effective, all of a sudden it's now, it's now something that, uh, that insurers might have to pay for. So, uh, and it's a key organizational change. That's the, that's the thing that's interesting about it. Uh, if, if, if you said we're going to have a political fight over chlamydia screening, you know, we might lose that fight. But if you say we're going to have a fight over whether or not the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is, is going to be somehow written out of public policy, that's actually an easier fight to, to win. So, uh, uh, so I've mentioned that. So if you learn nothing else today, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, you can tell your family about them. There, and finally, the, the, the Affordable Care Act established a prevention and public health fund that supports preventive services and public health infrastructure. Their, um, now the service will, um, the fund is going to allocate about $15 billion over the next decade or so. It's, it's in flux right now. Uh, the public health community wanted a lot more, but still $15 billion is substantial when compared to prior public health efforts of this type. It's a little bit pathetic how happy we are over $15 billion actually. Uh, the American health care system spends $2.6 trillion a year on, on health services. And it's sort of like McDonald's, every time you pass the sign, they've added a couple billion more, except in health care, we've added a couple hundred billion more each time. We spend these enormous sums of money on personal medical services, uh, yet getting basic money for public health and prevention is, is, a, is a heavy lift, and $15 billion makes a big difference. Uh, so for these reasons and more, uh, the Affordable Care Act is good public health policy, and it's something that its authors have a lot to be proud of. Uh, it has its shortcomings, which I'm going to turn to. Uh, it also coincides with many developments outside the, uh, the, the ambit of the particular bill that are really posing tremendous challenges for us. And you know, since we're in here in Illinois, for those of you that have traveled, you may not know that, uh, that we're in the middle of a profound fiscal crisis at the city, state, and county level in Illinois and in many other states. I think we, we may be the worst. I think we, we're the only state with a driving while governor problem. We've had, we've had five of the last nine governors arrested and put in, and incarcerated, and it's getting to the point where the police just pull over the limo and claim that there was a taillight out or something just so they can search, so they can search the back compartment. But um, we have tremendous uh, fiscal challenges, which in some ways are actually undoing many of the good things that health reform is trying to accomplish. Uh, now let me, um, uh, so there's, there's those challenges, but there's also some political challenges, some of which we should have anticipated before health reform was passed. So let me turn now to the political challenges. Each of the accomplishments that I just talked about before is under threat, and it's under threat by uh, a change to legislative landscape that I don't, I think those of you that listen to NPR, uh, certainly uh, uh, this morning's story is the 192nd story of the past week to describe the legislative challenges that, that we're facing. Uh, they're uh, uh, by the state and local fiscal crisis. 
and, and by some things in the design of the Affordable Care Act that made it less robust than it might have been to resist these challenges that we're now facing. So uh, I should say this, this was a law that was carefully crafted to get passed. And by get passed, I mean get 60 Senate votes. And how many uh, Republican votes were there for the Affordable Care Act? Anybody remember? There were th the number zero. <laughs> and it was actually a unique moment in history. Actually, I was part of the uh, Obama campaign advising it. And I remember we, were, we spent all of 2007 and 2008 explaining how stupid Hillary Clinton was and all the mistakes that she made in health reform. And I, I'm sure she was sitting there saying, okay, you do it. Uh, you know, you see how it is. And boy, I, 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 she seems less stupid to me now. Uh, uh, you know, we didn't make her mistakes, they just made new mistakes. There, but it, it was, I mean, that it was passed at all was really pretty miraculous. And it really testified to the determination and political skill of President Obama and Senator Reid and, and most of all probably Speaker Pelosi who really picked it up and carried it over the goal line. It's something President Roosevelt didn't do. It's something President Truman couldn't do. President Johnson was able to move part of the way with Medicaid and Medicare, something that President Nixon sort of tried to do and had actually a good plan we would have been happy with in retrospect. Uh, President Carter couldn't do it. Uh, President Clinton tr uh, couldn't. So, so uh, this is a heavy, heavy lift. We have an entire political system that is designed to favor the defense over the offense that is designed to favor small, uh, well, I should say by population, small rural states uh, that, uh, you know, there are, uh, if all of, I believe that the answer is that if 21% of the American public in the least sparsely populated states all got together, they could basically filibuster every bill in the United States Senate. And that's the system that we had, and the, and the need was to thread the needle to get this thing passed. And, they, and, and, it, and it's just an amazing accomplishment that it happened. And as soon as it's passed, its backers face this incredible challenge of implementing, preserving, and defending a relatively unpopular bill in the face of a hostile congressional majority. And had people really thought about that in some of the particulars of this bill, they probably would have designed the bill a little bit differently. And I hesitate, you know, hindsight is always 20-20, uh, so, uh, uh, so you never want to be too critical, especially when people have done a historic accomplishment. But I think we're seeing there's some aspects of this bill that are making it vulnerable and that we're paying the price right now. There, uh, I've just read, uh, there's a wonderful book by a political scientist named Eric Potochnik. Uh, raise your hand if you know who Eric Potochnik is. He's even more than the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. If you say a delicatessen, you actually get partial credit. <laughs> There's a famous delicatessen named Potochnik. There, um, but it was written well before, he wrote a book called Reforms at Risk. And it was written well before the health reform debate. And he, he, uh, uh, he examined the political feasibility of what he called general interest reforms. And what those are, are their reforms that provide broad-based social value but don't particularly advance the interests of specific constituencies. So he looked at things like deregulating trucking and tax reform and a bunch of issues, airline deregulation, and he found some of these general interest reforms endured, airline deregulation, for those of you who flew in being, being perhaps the most durable of these, and some of them, like the 1986 tax reform, were passed with great fanfare, but then gradually unraveled. And uh, those of you that have, that have read the U.S. Internal Revenue Code lately, which I do every night before bed, uh, know that, uh, that, that the ability to purge the tax system from loopholes has uh, you know, very rapidly eroded after that bill. Uh, now, Potashnik anticipated the most obvious political vulnerability and the most obvious substantive disappointment in, in health reform, which is how backloaded it is. I, I get a lot of phone calls actually from people who, uh, who have health issues and who somehow have read an article that I wrote or something like that and say, okay, I'm, you know, I just lost my job. What, how can, what can somebody do to help me? And many, many times the answer that I give to people is, you know, in 2014, there's really going to be some good help for you. 
And I went on the campaign trail. I remember one of the first things I did on the campaign trail was I was working on the phones. Uh, I was brought in downtown to the, when they first set up the, the Obama campaign had a very high tech computerized phone system to call voters. And they brought a bunch of the core of the faithful down to a boiler room in Chicago to test the thing out. And, and they decided that they would have me call African American rural voters in South Carolina. Now why they, you're laughing. I was not laughing. I was like, you know, why have you chosen me for this task, being, being so culturally fluent in the issues that people are likely to raise? I got a very positive reception when I was calling people. This is maybe the summer of 2007. Uh, but, um, but a lot of people with health problems. And I remember there was this one guy, he said, you know, I have diabetes and my wife is disabled and here's my medical bills. And if, and if Senator Obama wins, you know, what is he going to do to help me? And, and he didn't mean that in some will I am video way. He meant, you know, okay, I got this bill. What are you going to do for me? And it was like a punch in the stomach to say, you know, what can you say to someone knowing the heavy lift that was coming and not knowing whether we were going to be able to really help that person. And, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton wanted to help that person just as much as President Obama wanted to help that person. And she failed, you know, earlier. And I am so gratified that we can say to that person, you know, we passed health reform, except he's, I don't know if this guy's going to be alive in 2014 to benefit from some of those key things that were done. And so that's my greatest disappointment. It's also such a key vulnerability. As, as, as Eric Potoshnik put it, he said, it takes time for reforms to embed themselves in governing routines, but time is a luxury that, that reformers may not have. Moreover, reforms do not endure because they're frozen in place, rather they endure because they reconfigure the political dynamic. And that's a key standard that we have to think about health reform with. Health reform will eventually reconfigure American politics. Uh, in some ways it already has. Uh, no one's going to take away health coverage for young adults that are on their parents' health plan now. That would be a political kamikaze maneuver for anyone to try that. No one's going to take away some of the regulations that have already been put in place to prevent insurers from rescinding people's health care based on a pre-existing condition. Uh, but many of the key provisions are not operative yet. And in fact, they won't be operative for at least two elections the 2012 national election and the 2014 election as well. And so for the very reasons that I just identified, the opponents of health reform have very good reasons to make sure that those provisions just never take effect. Uh, and you know, backloading was kind of the original sin of this bill. And I, I, th I think uh, it has not yet made an immediate and tangible difference in enough people's lives to really have that boots on the ground permanence that, that it needs to have. And I said, in the meanwhile, states and localities are experiencing this profound fiscal crisis. Uh, they're, uh, I should say on the House side in particular, uh, during both the stimulus and health reform, there's a real effort to use health reform and health services to help local governments. And you'll hear about some of that a little later today. There were some successes, but uh, many of these were precisely the items that were cut out in the political pushing and shoving. Uh, in both the stimulus debate and, and health reform. I think most famously, uh, uh, Speaker Boehner uh, commented last April, how can you spend hundreds of millions of dollars on contraceptives? How does that stimulate the economy? And somehow the idea that contraceptives are a non-trivial expense for many low-income women in a tough economy, that, that somehow escaped him uh, and escaped a lot of other people. Ironically, the services that have been the hardest hit during the crisis are health services. Uh, they're health services that are provided outside of the ambit of Medicaid, but they're critical services provided by state and local governments. And a lot of the public health system is exactly in that position. It's, it's hard for states to cut things that are supported by Medicaid. They couldn't do that during the period covered by the stimulus. They don't want to lose their federal match. But health services that states provide that are outside of Medicaid uh, you know, become doubly vulnerable because those are the places you can cut and where you're, 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 you're in a fiscal crisis and the federal government's not going to constrain you from cutting those services. So thousands of public health workers have been cut off. A lot of health departments are reducing services. 
uh, or they're using the monies that they have to provide basic health care for 50 million uninsured people. And there's a lot of other uh, things that the public health system has to do that it can't do because it's providing clinical services for people. And so before we do something about the uninsured in 2014, we're really going to squeeze the uh, health system profoundly. I feel, talking as a public health policy analyst, I feel a little like the people talking about the Arab-Israeli conflict, where you say, what's going to happen in 2050? And they say, well, there's sort of, there's going to be two states, and it's going to kind of look like this, and they're going to argue about this spot, but basically this is what's going to happen. And then you say, what's going to happen in next year? And the people say, I have no idea. Uh, you know, how we, you know, I sort of see the long run, but the short run is completely, I'm, I'm baffled. And that's kind of where we are right now in a lot of the public health system. There, uh, I actually, I must say, I'm surprised by one aspect of this. Uh, states are just desperate for money. And I had thought that after health reform was passed, that a lot of the partisan brawling would stop or at least be diminished because governors would want to go into the back room and negotiate about how they could get more cash from the federal government. And, and that's happening. There's a lot of Republican governors who are suing the, over the constitutionality of the mandate, but they're still coming down to Washington and asking for money. Uh, but actually, the extent that Republicans have maintained an ideological and partisan unity in opposing health care reform is, is quite impressive, actually, uh, in, uh, I think that there was always the belief among a lot of Democrats that they would be appealing off of at least some Republicans that would, that would make it politically easier to do this. And that's just not, not happening. And it's interesting that people like Senators Collins and Snow, who are moderate on social issues, uh, when it comes down to key procedural votes in the United States Senate, uh, you know, are sticking with the leadership. And, uh, uh, you know, you actually have to commend the Republican leadership for their political skill and being able to do that. Uh, I must say I'm surprised by that, and it's made the implementation of health care reform that much more challenging. There, um, uh, now let me make a, a second point. Uh, there's a second systematic weakness of this bill. Some of its key provisions rely on the appropriations decisions of future Congresses. Uh, the Prevention and Public Health Fund may be the best example of this. There's already been three efforts to kill it that are fairly serious. And, and some of the, you might think, listening to the debate, that there's a big ideological issue going on. There was a, there was a Republican aide who quipped that, it, that this is a slush fund for jungle gyms. And when I heard that, I sort of thought, well, that sounds a little like midnight basketball to me, for those of you that are old enough to remember the midnight basketball debate. And there's, some, so, and there's a lot of things in the public health fund that raise some kind of culture war issues. And if you think about what the public health systems deal with, they deal with people with drug problems or people who are having sex, things that in, in America we don't do. They're, um, the, um, uh, but the simple fact is it's not about ideology or culture war stuff. What it's about is this, this is an appropriation. And there's a lot of reasons why people might want that $15 billion for something else, or they might want to be able to put a pelt on the wall that says that we've taken away a piece of health reform, and this is an easy way to do it. And although the, that public health fund provides money for some really valued services, it's really not structured to maximize its probability of survival it, uh, when, when the politics are not favorable. So it doesn't create an institutional change like the Preventive Services Task Force that I mentioned. It doesn't create legal obligations to provide a specific service to a particular recipient that might make the money harder to cut off. Uh, it, it doesn't really create a, uh, a set of constituencies and interest groups that really, really want this thing to survive. And uh, you know, if you think about it, uh, if, you th if you compare this to agricultural subsidies, spending on specific weapon systems, or small business owners, or home mortgages, or health coverage, or higher education, or university academic research, uh, it doesn't cultivate a concentrated constituency that's well equipped to, to defend itself. Instead, it's serving a largely disorganized and politically marginal set of constituencies that just need the help. Like one of the ironies is when something gets attacked as a pork barrel expenditure, very often that means it's not a pork barrel expenditure because the things that really are pork barrel, if you call them that, people tend to get offended who you don't want to offend. You know, if you sort of say the home mortgage deduction is a pork barrel thing, then people are going to get mad. Uh, if you say the University of Chicago and other big academic medical centers are getting some gimmick that we shouldn't be getting, that tends to make us mad. 
But if you say chlamydia screening is a pork barrel thing, it's a little, you know, who, the, the people may be mad about it, but it's not clear that you get the same. The, the, you're not as worried about that. You know, the sort of the callers to the smoking cessation line, uh, they're, you're not so worried that those people are going to call and get a busy signal as you might be that you screw up small business people's taxes. One of the, one of the provisions that uh, Republicans didn't like was that there was a tax reporting uh, thing that created paperwork for small business. So, uh, you know, how many Americans know there's such a thing as Title 10 or Title 20 and whether these things get cut? Not, not very many, and it makes it, it, makes it, very, uh, makes it very hard. There, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm blathering on at some length, so I'm going to skip over some brilliant insights I was about to say to get to some others. Now, not every public health measure is so politically vulnerable. I think one of the ironies, by the way, is some of these, some, some measures turn out to be quite sustaining in a way that we need to learn from. Probably the easiest example to mention are tobacco taxes. Uh, it's funny, two Republicans running for president right now are being criticized because they raised tobacco taxes in their state. Uh, Mitch Daniels and uh, Haley Barber. And of course, from a public health point of view, these are like the two things that I like about what they did. They're... Um, but uh, these taxes have proved amazingly durable. And in fact, we had a hard time getting a lot of these taxes passed, but now that they're passed, uh, they're, it's actually really, really hard for people to try to repeal them. And, the, and uh, there's, there's, of course, a, a strong body of scientific research that says tobacco taxes are very good f to improve population health. It's a great way to prevent young people from starting to smoke. Uh, but the states really need the revenue is what's really important in the political sense. You know, of course, we'd like to see that money used for um, public health purposes, but just the fact that states value it politically means that tobacco taxes are sustainable, and in fact, they've gone up quite a bit over time. Between 1995 and 2009, the federal tax went up 321%. It helps finance the CHIP program. And at the state level, it's actually gone up 267%. And even states like Mississippi and, and some of the tobacco states have actually increased their tobacco taxes because they need the revenue. And uh, uh, so that's a pretty significant, pretty significant thing. Uh, and so we have, to, we have to think more carefully about how we can create things that are sustaining. And there's certainly, there's a lot of good things. You'll hear some things later today about how health insurance exchanges are designed that include some critical components that increase reproductive health services. Uh, how can we create organizational shifts that make it more costly to reverse public health gains? I think that's a really, that's a really important question that we, be, that we need to ask ourselves. Not, not have I given X billion dollars for a worthy cause right now? Because that X billion dollars a, it's, we're going to have to refight that battle again, and B, it may not be quite as safe as we think it is the moment it's passed. Uh, but we need to think about how do we pass policies that nurture the conditions for their future success. And we can be politically generative when we attract new allies and friendly interest groups uh, and do other things that, that have that forward-looking dimension. When I think about this public health prevention fund, for example, a lot of us in the public health community liked the idea that it was given out by basically through an evidence-based process in some ways. And you, you sort of, if you said to me, Harold, what's the best way this money's given out? I say, hire some really smart guy, sit him down in the assistant secretary for planning and evaluations office in HHS and tell him to give out the money to the people that are gonna do the best thing. And don't let the governors get their hands on it because they're going to waste it on stuff like DARE and abstinence education and stuff that doesn't work. And you know, it's true that abstinence education doesn't work. But there's one problem with the model that I just suggested. If, it's great if, if uh, oh goodness, uh, I have five minutes to go. There, um, some of you have just smiled. There, um, <laughs> Uh, it's great if you get to, if you have the, the political muscle to make that happen, that's great. But of course, if someone tries to cut that money, it'd be awfully nice if there was some governor who cared whether or not that money was appropriated. And even if they wasted some of that money on abstinence education, I think we probably would have had a better political deal in the long run for the good programs if we had given the governors some sort of a more immediate political stake in that money. There are no, let me just m spend my last few minutes talking about public opinion and how that matters. Uh, 
the, uh, if you ask why health reform was finally passed, you could give a lot of explanations, and I think the 2008 election and the composition of the Congress is by far the most important election. President Clinton would have passed health reform if he had the Senate and the Congress that President Obama did. There's nothing that President Obama did that was particularly smarter than what President Clinton did. It's just he had more bullets in the gun to get the thing done in a lot of ways. Uh, but there's also uh, the sort of political science explanation and the balance of forces doesn't fully explain it. Because when things were really teetering on the edge, particularly the days after Scott Brown was elected in Massachusetts, one of the things that really mattered was there was a guy in the White House and there were people in the Senate and the Congress who thought this was really important. You know, President Obama, he had, he had been on the campaign trail and he met a lot of very sick people who lost their homes because they had cancer. And there's a human face to this that's very real and that matters a lot to the public and that matters a lot to the policymakers, and that makes itself felt. And I think when we focus on the fact that we spend $2.6 trillion and we don't treat people decently despite that unbelievably huge expense, people resonate with that. And I think there's a level that we all know this has to be fixed. When we start arguing about the incomprehensible policy details, the public attention and support starts to wander off. And there's a human face that's really important. And the same thing is true in reproductive services and family planning. Uh, I, right now we're witnessing an almost de facto repeal of Roe v. Wade around the country. If you look at what South Dakota, for example, is doing, uh, essentially the message has gone out that, uh, that, that you can do very tough regulations of abortion at the state level. And the people of South Dakota are ultimately going to decide what South Dakota law is going to be about people seeking abortions. And uh, uh, the American public is ambivalent about, about reproductive health, is ambivalent about sexuality, is ambivalent about a lot of the stuff that's in the, that we're talking about today. And we have to honor that ambivalence. I think it's politically and morally critical to, to honor that and to know there's good people on all sides of this debate. Um, but I think also that we have to show the human faces of the, of the, particularly the women who, who come seeking these services and who need help. And a lot of Americans who are ambivalent about abortion are also not ready to sign on to policies that basically bully low-income women about issues that higher-income women uh, don't have to deal with, but that we all know. We all know that, uh, uh, there's a, there, that affluent women, that middle-class women are getting a lot of the services that, that low-income women show up at Planned Parenthood to try to get and who need help with. And showing that human face is going to be a critical part of making public policy sustainable. And it reminds me, I was, I'm old enough to remember some of the policy issues in the crack epidemic. And what was interesting was, if you asked in public opinion polls, what do you think of women who use crack when they're pregnant? You were getting, basically it's like saying, what do you think of Bernie Madoff? Uh, and, and a lot of jurors would show up there were some places that tried to prosecute pregnant women who used drugs. And the jurors were expecting to see some sort of a criminal. And what happened was a fragile human being showed up. And it turned out that all these prosecutions across the country, there's a wonderful book by Laura Gomez called Misconceiving Mothers that tells this story. These prosecutions were a complete disaster. As soon as the jurors saw these women and saw the situations of their lives, by they saw physicians come from ACOG and other professional societies and saying, you know, it's really not a good public policy to prosecute these women. And in fact, we can't tell you that if something bad happened to their baby that it was because of the drugs that they used. Maybe it was because of their all kinds of other issues with these women. The jurors said, why are we here? Why are we, why are we arresting this woman rather than finding a way to help her? And we have to, we have to put that human face out there uh, so that people have a sense of what's at stake. Now, I don't think that general public opinion is the be-all and end-all of things. I think the fact that the majority of Americans are, are pro-choice is really not the key political variable because in many ways the, the pro-life people want it more and are in a position to, to, they have more leverage in some of the critical moments in our politics. But it matters a lot. And, and I think public opinion is a very subtle thing. People are, have a lot of different opinions. So, 
So I would just say that, that we have to focus on making our reforms more sustainable, but we also have to focus on making them more human and having a way to explain to people the humanity of what we're doing and, that's, and that this is why it's so important that many of these policies are passed and endure. Thank you very much. You can stretch now. I'm sorry, that was a long talk. <laughs> Dr. Pollack, my name is Ann Sheets. I'm with Physicians for a National Health Program and the Illinois Single Payer Coalition. I do think that you understated the uh, failures of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Um, as far as the Medicaid expansion, what we're seeing in the states, and I attended some of the hearings in Illinois, is uh, the insurance industry seeing Medicaid as an opportunity for them to acquire a whole millions more uh, captive patients. And you see states forcing patients on Medicaid into for-profit HMOs. Um, the the $2.6 trillion that the United States spends on our health care non-system, fully 30% of that is administrative costs, bureaucracy. And PPAC does nothing to address that. In fact, it creates bureaucracy. And while Illinois is, trying, is cutting back on public health services, it has hired bureaucrats to administer these state exchanges, which are so complicated that just listening to the discussions, you can see that they're going to fall apart. Um, the safety net uh, PPAC is going to take money away from safety net hospitals in the form of their disproportionate share payments and give that money to the insurance companies in order to subsidize purchase of insurance for mm -hmm. people who can't afford to pay for it themselves. And then one of the ways somebody has, one writer has put it, is that we are all going to be bronzed. We, we are all going to be able to afford only health insurance at the lowest level that covers 60% of costs, of the medical well, costs, leaving us with 40% of the costs. So 60% actuarial value, some of the insurance uh, products will have that. People who have to pay 40% of their costs are not going to be able to get access to health care. And at the best, this uh, law is going to leave 23 million people with no insurance. So whatever people may think about some of the benefits of this law, we have to say this is not enough. Well, we let me cut in there. I, I'm yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, believe, mm -hmm. I think you stated very well the, the critique, uh, and so I, I, I'm, I think that's an important. That's one that I take seriously. And I must say, I personally would be quite happy to see a single payer system of some sort. Uh, from a public health perspective, there's no doubt that there's many advantages to that. I think that uh, we have to help people through incremental politics, and uh, there's a lot. It, when you look at the heavy lift that we just had, uh, and I can tell you that I just, I just think that I would, I would love to see people pushing a public option. I would love to see people moving in the direction that would facilitate a, a, a single payer plan. Uh, I also think that if we wait until the political stars align for that to happen, we've got an awfully long wait. So, uh, please. Hi, Suzanne Walzak from the Medical College of Wisconsin. Thank you so much for an informative talk. Um, two quick questions. The first is, as a clinician, I already see so much effective rationing to patients of the Medicaid population because of the low reimbursement rates and um, offices and institutions only accepting a certain number of patients. Adding 16 million to that number seems to be intimidating. And what are your thoughts about that? I think low reimbursement rate is the below the radar scandal of Medicaid in many states. Uh, I think that is, that actually, I would identify backloading and failing to address the Medicaid reimbursement rate as the two critical failures. Uh, although, I mean, there's some efforts in primary care, there's, there's some increase in reimbursement rates for primary care providers. Uh, there, I think there's a couple of things that we need to do. One is we need to federalize some aspects of Medicaid. So, and, and help people. I think we need to make the exchanges more flexible so that some of the people that will, some of those 16 million people could get into exchanges that would have um, more favorable reimbursement. I think the problem with that is that we would have to spend money. And uh, uh, there's, 
I think that, that we have a very serious problem with Medicaid. I think in the short run, what's going to happen is we're going to have to use non-physicians more creatively for the Medicaid population, and we're going to have to really uh, keep pushing. Uh, I mean, at, at some level, there's the le Sarah Rosenbaum has done some interesting work about whether the Medicaid reimbursement rates are so low that they really are not guaranteeing people their legal right to care. Uh, I know in this hospital, that the way we are treated by the state of Illinois makes it very, very hard for us to treat poor people with the decency that they deserve. And I think people blame the hospital, but it's a structural problem in public policy that's a lot bigger than the hospital. So I, I think your point, I, I wish I had a better answer to your point. I think it's, it, that is one of the key challenges that we're going to see. And I think if the federal government tries to shift burdens onto the state, for example, with the block granting of Medicaid would be a disaster because that will really, really encourage states to even ratchet those rates down further. So. And then briefly, I just also wanted to follow up. Um, as an abortion provider, I provide abortions for women in all kinds of situations, but the women who are seeking procedures because of lethal fetal anomalies are currently receiving coverage under Medicaid. And I think that that issue is different or perceived differently by the public in a lot of ways, and we're quite concerned about losing that for women in, in truly life threatening situations. I think that I'm, I'm, there's plenty of people later today who are more expert. I share that concern and I look forward to learning about these issues over the day. <laughs>